Okay, let's get this party started. All right, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you all for joining us today. My name is Danielle Davis, and I'll be coordinating things on the back end of the event. Um, if you have any questions uh, during this time or after, then feel free to put your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of the window. And then um, we're gonna go through those and Dr. Giordani is gonna address them at the end of the presentation. This event is being recorded, um, and if you want to view it later um, or just go back and look at some of the other presentations that have happened before this one, then you're more than welcome to check out the link on the YouTube page, and then it's going to come in an email after this presentation. Um, feedback. Feedback is welcome and greatly appreciated. There will be an event evaluation that is going to be prompted right at the conclusion of the presentation. It's about seven questions. If you could just take the time to fill that out, we'd greatly appreciate it. Um, if you don't have the time today, you will receive the link in an email to complete the evaluation. So for those that are uh, maybe joining us for the first time or new to the Michigan Alzheimer's Disease Research Center, we're a center here in Ann Arbor and a collaboration between University of Michigan, Wayne State, and Michigan State University. We offer a variety of dementia-related research studies, and so if you're interested in learning more about our wellness programs for caregivers, um, the Lewy Body Dementia Support Groups, or if you want to get involved with research, then please feel free to visit our website, our social media, or you can reach out to me and I'll be sure to point you in the right direction. So before we start our talk today, um, we're going to hear, oh excuse me, um, just some greetings that we're going to receive from Jennifer Leppard, who is the chapter president and CEO of the Alzheimer's Association Greater Michigan Chapter. So Jennifer, take it away. Hi, welcome to everyone. We are so happy that you're joining us today. Um, I'm really always excited and enjoy hearing Bruno's discussion, so I know you will too. Hope you all get something new out of it, and please make sure to ask questions. Sometimes that is the most exciting information that we get. It's prompted from a question. Um, I do want to just um, remind everyone, for those joining us, that the Alzheimer's Association is working virtually like everybody else, but we are working. And we have education programs, support groups, our call center, all of that is functioning. Our program staff have done a great job making sure that everything is available virtually. We have early stage programming available virtually. So please make sure that you visit our website, www.alz.org um, slash GMC to get you to all things Michigan. And we will be happy to assist you or anyone um, that needs assistance. So please make sure you're continuing to reach out to us. Um, before I introduce Bruno, I do want to do a little plug for WALK. Um, you know, for those of you who've been involved with the association, uh, the WALK 10 Alzheimer's, it is WALK season right now. And as you can imagine, WALK in a pandemic is a little bit of a challenge. Uh, we are used to getting together in really big groups across the country. We have 25 WALKs alone in Michigan. And because of COVID, we are not able to get together. Um, and, but we are still walking. And what the way we're describing walk this year is walk is everywhere. So we are asking people to walk with their family, with their friends, in their neighborhoods, uh, at their local parks. We have uh, our Promise Garden flowers set up in all of our communities. Um, we've had about half our walk so far. Um, we have our Detroit walk coming up on Saturday. We have our Ann Arbor walk coming up the first weekend of October. And we have many other walks going on across the state. An even greater thing this year is even if you missed the local walk in your community, you can still walk in your local community on any date. Um, it's kind of a do-it-yourself walk this year, so don't be constrained. So we are asking everyone to please consider either joining a walk team um, you can sign up a walk team really easily at alz.org slash walk. It'll help you find the walk nearest you. And we have a special promotion for all of you research nerds today is that anybody who signs up a walk team today can get a purple ALZ fleece blanket. Um, all you have to do after you sign up your walk team. See, Bruno is happy now. He hasn't signed up his team yet. He's getting a blanket. Um, we can get all you have to do, and I will put all this in the chat, is after you sign up your walk team, send an email to Amelia Zubek on our team. Let her know you signed up a team, you were on the uh, research call, and we will make sure that you get a fleece blanket. So it is very helpful for us to grow our teams. It helps us with our sponsors. It helps get other money in the door. 
So please consider helping us out. If for some reason you can't do a team, go to the WAP page and find a team that you want to support and make a donation. That would be terrific. So I really appreciate um, you guys considering that. And I will put all that good information in, um, in the chat. I hope we run out of fleece blankets. So with that, I am going to introduce Bruno. Bruno has a very impressive history um, commitment to this issue and has done a tremendous amount of work. So I want to make sure that I do his biography justice. So I'm going to read this. Um, oh. So please bear with me, but there's so many things you need to know about him. So Dr. Giordani, PhD, is the Senior Director for the Mary A. Rackham Institute in the University of Michigan Rackham Graduate School and is the Chief of Psychology in the Department of Psychiatry. He is a tenured professor in the Departments of Psychiatry, Neurology, and Psychology, as well as at the School of Nursing at the University of Michigan. He is also Associate Director of the Michigan Alzheimer's Disease Research Center and has a longstanding history of connecting with the community to promote a better understanding of Alzheimer's disease and related conditions. His research initiatives focus on a cross-cultural perspective on the early assessment of cognitive and behavioral changes associated with medical illness and the interaction of cognition and mobility across the lifespan. Um, so again, I've always enjoyed every presentation that Bruno's given and I really welcome him today and thank you all for joining us and I'm gonna turn the stage over to him. Thank you so much, Bruno. Thanks, Jennifer. I appreciate it. I, I, um, I have one thing to tell you before we start, folks. I am wearing a nice jacket, my um, Alzheimer's Association uh, tie, a nice purple shirt, and I'm wearing purple socks, and that's all I'm going to let you know I'm wearing. So uh, you can take a guess on the rest. But it's great to be able to talk outside in your backyard. So what I was asked to talk about today is um, some of the background in Alzheimer's, but in particular to talk about what's the sort of latest news on Alzheimer's research that came out of the Alzheimer's International Conference. This is a conference that the Alzheimer's Association has been, has been running for many, many years. Um, it started out every two years and then things started moving so fast it became every year. This year, of course, because of all the issues, um, there were no trips to Amsterdam and everything moved virtually. But in some ways, you know, that may have really increased the ability because now you had 33,000 registrants. I could let all my friends who, who my colleagues and collaborators in Africa know all about this this time. And 160 countries were represented this year. So it, it really was quite amazing. Next. Next slide. Oh. Okay. Oh, sorry. I forgot I'm not advancing. So. Um, Quick disclosure of, of uh, financial relationships. I have to do that for the university for every study. I'm not making any money on this. I am not selling you anything and I don't have any money anyway. So my kids have all of it. So uh, next slide. And the other thing I always do before I start a talk is thank you all. I thank you for uh, coming here and listening to me. I thank you for um, participating in our research studies. I thank you for signing up to the walk, which um, Jennifer is priority sticking into the chat. Don't forget to do that. Um, I thank you for contributing dollars to the Alzheimer's Association and to our center. And I thank you for paying your taxes because your taxes fund a, a lot, quite a bit of the research that goes on. It's the, the, um, the incredible amount of research that, that it's able to do, not only because of NIH, but also because of the Alzheimer's Association, it's the third largest uh, funder of research there. So um, next slide. And um, the reason why these thank yous are important is because if there is lots of activity and lots of things going on, then, there will be lots of people hearing about it. You have lots of opportunity. There's suddenly movies like Still Alice or the Glenn Campbell story. You, young people become much more involved. All of this is critically important as we get enough people and get enough mass to, to next slide, affect the people that really count in this, which are the politicians. And really, from the time of Ronald Reagan, really carried forward by, by uh, President Obama and, 
and even in the current administration, President Trump have signed off increasing amounts of dollars to Alzheimer's research. And our own um, Michigan, both representatives and senators are, have been very much in the center of this fight. So I think by all of us coming together, reminding our representatives and congressmen that this is important to us, this has made a big difference in terms of funding. Next, next slide. So today, talk briefly about Alzheimer's disease. Then I'll talk more about the meat of what's going on in um, the, what went on in the AAIC conference. And then um, I'll let you know a lot about what we're doing in the Michigan Alzheimer's Disease Center, because in many ways, what you see in the conference is what we end up doing in the Alzheimer's Center. So there's a lot of interest that way. So, um, and then I'll talk a little bit about how you can be involved in research, both for us and um, also contributions you can make to the Alzheimer's Association. Next slide. So in terms of the science behind Alzheimer's, next slide. So the biggest question that often comes up is, and I've talked about this on a number of my talks, so I'm, I'm sorry to say it again, but it's important. People ask, what's the difference between dementia and Alzheimer's disease? And this slide from the Alzheimer's Association actually really summed it up better than, than I could ever do, which is dementia is the umbrella term. It, it describes a range of, of symptoms that are associated with cognitive impairment and a decline in cognition and ability to, in particular, ability to do your daily living tasks. And if, but there are multiple types of, of, of dementias. Alzheimer's disease is the biggest, 50 to 75% of all dementias are Alzheimer's disease. That's why we talk so much about it. But we have to remember all these other uh, types of Alzheimer's, uh, I mean, excuse me, types of dementia that are so important to understand. Vascular dementia, 20 to 30%, Lewy body, 10 to 25%, frontal temporal, 10 to 15%. Frontal temporal is a very significant disorder that, that affects people even earlier than Alzheimer's disease and for the most part. So these critical areas, and especially those smaller ones on the side, in, in many ways are what we're interested in as an Alzheimer's associate, as, excuse me, as an Alzheimer's center. A lot of our research is sort of around those, those other dementias like vascular dementia and Lewy body disease. Next slide. So why do I worry about this? I worry about this for a number of reasons. And the biggest one is a massive growth in what we will see as prevalence as we move from current to 2050. There are massive increases across America, across Africa, across Southeast Asia and Europe in the number of people. So I don't get to ask you all and see who, whose idea, who, who's got the right idea, but I will tell you the reason for this is not because this disorder is catchy or anything like that. The fact is age is the strongest predictor of, of Alzheimer's disease. And we are a people now who live longer. Probably if we look at every, all of you out there, I'd say probably up to 40 to 50% of you will live to be 100 nowadays. The, the other thing is not only are we living longer, our longevity, but also people that represent, that I'm part of, um, baby boomers. There are a lot more older people around now. So because age is such a significant predictor, as you, you know, if you look at people 85 and older, 40 to 50% of them will have Alzheimer's disease, 45 to 50% even. So that age being such a critical factor gives us all this, this uh, dramatic and very troubling um, increase. Next slide. So let me just mention this. There's a little bit about the science of Alzheimer's, but you need to know the basic science too. So inside the healthy human brain, there are a lot, billions, billions and billions. There are billions of neurons, each with an axon. So these neurons are the, really the cells of the brain that, that help us, that really make us, allow us to make decisions and things. So each of these neurons has an axon. 
a long messenger coming out of there, which you can see a sort of long, long um, messenger part of the axon. And at the end of that are little synapses that connect from one cell to another. And there are trillions of these synapses. And, and one axon can connect to multiple aspects of, of multiple um, neurons. So that really all these things together, that's what, you know, I tend to move my hands a lot because I'm Italian, but all this moving of the hands is, is lighting up all sorts of stuff in the motor cortex because each of these cells are firing off as I want to move my hand one way or another. So this is an extremely complex system. So if you stick something into this system and mess it up, you can imagine it can have sort of catastrophic downstream problems. Next slide. So I want to mention, I, I got a little, I got a little friend flying a little, um, I got a little um, fly flying around me. Um, that's the other problem with outside, you never know what you'll get. But anyway, in terms of Alzheimer's disease, you know, and, and why, you know, like, where does it come from? Why, who, when did we find out about it? Well, it's been here forever. But the first person to really realize that Alzheimer's was a disease was Dr. Alzheimer's. At that time, you got to name yourself after a disease. And, and um, he found somebody when he was, he was doing his rounds. He was a psychiatrist, a neurologist, a neuropathologist. At that time, everybody did everything. But when he was making rounds in a psychiatric hospital, he noticed this woman by the name of August Dieter. And she just seemed to have symptoms that didn't match everybody else. Um, she had odd memory disturbances. She would forget what she was starting to write. She had odd visual uh, spatial disturbances that other psychiatric patients didn't have. And so from when she was 51 to when she was 55, he, he followed her and went and described these different changes in symptoms that occurred that were quite unusual for psychiatric patients. And, and when she died, he did an autopsy. And at that autopsy, he looked at her brain compared to other healthy brains, and he basically was able to look at her brain and describe the now classic, the hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease. Of, of the, he was able, even at that time, over a, just over 100 years ago, to be able to see with a microscope these changes that, that showed the brain wasn't right. Next slide. So if you look at the little box, the little box on, um, is healthy cells on the left. That's what the brain looks like, these, these axons and these um, coming off of the neurons. But what happens in Alzheimer's disease, one of the classic hallmarks is amyloid plaques. So something called precursor protein APP doesn't get broken down properly to, to nourish the, the axons. And basically it can't be digested and it begins to, to clump together in, in plaques. So that's that mess you see. And at the same time, we know as that, at some point as that starts to happen, probably a ways after that starts to happen, you also get tau tangles. And tau is, if you think of that long axon and you think of the cement that holds that together, essentially for some reason, maybe it's the contact with amyloid, maybe it's something else going on, that tau tends to fall out of those axons. The axons begin to misshape and the tau forms tangles, just like plaques, it forms tangles that get back into the cells and start to damage the cells. So you see a very different experience where you see these, as you can see on the left, these misshapen cells and these bundles of plaque around. So this is exactly what, exactly what Dr. Alzheimer's described. Next slide. The other important thing about this disease is this is a disease of cell death. The brain changes, the physical brain changes. You get shrinkages, especially on the bottom of the slide, you'll see it says shrinkages 
in the hippocampus, areas of the brain involved in memory. These areas become particularly infected. And then this disease stretches to the outsides of the brain and you begin to see the cortex shriveling as well. So all of this happening has the effect of changing cognition. And whichever area of this brain is most affected, whether it's um, the hippocampus or whether it's the outer areas or whether it's certain of the outer areas and not others, that's what dictates the symptoms that a person has because those cells aren't there anymore to do what they're supposed to. The memory cells are not functioning because there aren't enough of them to function. Next slide. So another thing people always tend to ask is, okay, you guys are so bright, you scientists, you're telling me this was a uh, hundred years ago, how come you haven't done anything yet? You know, hey, we're, we're working on vaccines right away, how come you guys haven't done anything yet? And there, there are some really interesting reasons for this. And this sort of um, graphic here sort of shows you why. So in 1906, August Dieter's case was reported by Dr. Alzheimer's. Kreplin popped up. He was another scientist and is sort of saying, hey, I'm better than, than uh, a little better than Dr. Alzheimer's. But he popped up and he said, aha, she's only 50 years old. This is what we're going to call pre-senile dementia. This is early dementia, early aging. That's all it is. And so then really from 1906, till really the 70s, we thought we were studying a disease, and this is when I was doing research in the 70s, we thought we were studying a disease that was very infrequent, that mainly affected a few families carrying this gene. Actually about 200,000 people only in the world have early onset uh, dementia the way, the way August Dieter had, but the truth is in the 70s and 80s, we realized that these are all basically the same disease. And so, but it still took into the 70s and 80s for the basic research to then suddenly be done again on what are plaques and tangles. And so from 1906, when he described this disease to 1984, when, when he, um, to 1984, when we first had a diagno diagnostic category published, that was an incredibly long time. But it wasn't until 94 that somebody said, okay, this is what Alzheimer's really looks like, and this is how you should treat it. Now, then when we hit into the 90s and the 2000s, then things began to take off. Some early genetic work. In 2012, a whole new diagnostic criteria was established, citing mild cognitive impairment and, and uh, other things. 2018, we had an even new potential research criteria um, put forward. So this is all really exciting. By the way, you can't see this on a blue screen, but there's a four-year-old wandering around with a gigantic water pistol. So if I scream at any minute, next slide. So in its most basic form, this is what we feel is happening. And we can now, and the reason why we know this, that we know this is really happening is because the past maybe five to 10 years or so, less than 10 years, we've actually got ways to image this process. So we can now, if you look to the picture on the left, it is a, a amyloid plaque. So what we know happens is increased amyloid begins to appear on the brain, which we can see on scanning often 20 years or more probably before anything ever happens. That amyloid is deposited, there's inflammation, we know that happens in the brain, and during that process, we begin to see tangles forming or tau beginning to drop out. So we get amyloid clumping, but we get tau dropping out. So what happens is, if you look at the, it, at the tau scanner, you see relatively the same distribution between amyloid and tau, but a little bit of difference there. So again, we're seeing these things don't mirror each other perfectly, but they're going on. And eventually, as I said before, cells die. The problem with this model is that, that 
it's only when cells begin to die that you can really diagnose somebody with Alzheimer's. So this whole 20 or 30 year um, travel through life that people do with Alzheimer's patients do with amyloid increasing in the brain, nobody says anything. Nobody's tried to, nobody gets, has really had a full chance of stopping it. It becomes a major issue. What if we stop amyloid from depositing? What if we stop lymph inflammation? What if we stop tangles forming? Would any of that stop Alzheimer's disease? We're just only now beginning to, to look at that. As a matter of fact, the only drugs that have been, um, that are on market now, like Aricept and Galantamine and things, are drugs that affect, that essentially add transmission chemicals to the brain so as cells die, there's still more chance for, for um, fewer cells to have a little better transmission. So that's called, you know, just affecting the symptoms of the disease. The question now is, can we affect the disease process itself and interrupt it? Next slide. So one of the things that happens now, because we can picture this, is a lot of interest to say, you know, we can diagnose by, um, by symptoms, memory symptoms or other things, but I bet we could also diagnose early by looking at early signs of risk, that is amyloid scan signs, the first signs of actual disease or the tau appearing, as well as then looking at when we, we found neurodegeneration when there's brain changes. And we could actually make a little chart that has an A for amyloid, plus or minus, evidence or not, T for tau, plus or minus, and N for neurodegeneration, sort of apparent changes in MRI scans and things, or basic PET scans, glucose, uh, glucose PET scans, and that would be the N for the brain actually changing. So this is a really interesting issue that's going on. I'll tell you one thing that's caused some consternation is this ignores behavior. And we do know that some people may have a brain with amyloid and even tau evidence and no appearance of, of cognitive impairment. So this is a real, a real question, but we do know that these biological processes go on just as we know that high blood pressure or, or changes in, in uh, lipids lead to problems occurring in life. So the hope is, can we use this type of classification? Next slide. So this is that little classification. I'll just show you real quickly. So we essentially have a normal person is negative for amyloid tau and brain changes, neurodegeneration. Then there's this sort of change for what, what happens when, when the A becomes positive. And then what happens when the A and T are positive, then the idea is you have Alzheimer's disease. And this may be far before, excuse me, did I say silence my phone? But that, that was my phone, but I, uh, I don't know why it went off. So, oh, my wife just said she was sorry she was picking her, her phone dial. Um, we'll have to discuss why your tile sent my phone off, but anyway, so um, you can make this little criteria and say, okay, if there's amyloid, we're talking about Alzheimer's disease. If there isn't amyloid, then we're talking about something else, tauopathies or some other type of neurodegeneration. But A plus amyloid means Alzheimer's. Next slide. There's even a recent study that did this. They looked at, they presented this at, at AEIC. So looking at a large number of people who came in um, because of subjective memory complaints, concerns about memory that, that hadn't yet been noted on say cognitive testing and such. When we did that, when, when this study was done, you could actually find the majority of people were in the green for having no amyloid, nothing going on, but they could look at that percentage of people who showed amyloid and tau 
and actually follow them over time. So these are people with no apparent disease, but you could follow them over time. So this is a wonderful way of doing things. The only problem with this is, and you can see at the very bottom, those bigger numbers show you that there was much higher risk in those patient groups who had the amyloid and the tau. The problem with all this though is that, that this is incredibly expensive. You know, we're, we're right now for my, for my study, I think I'm, I'm paying a very large amount of money per each amyloid scan I do. Add a tau scan to that, you're looking at $14,000 or so. And, and an MRI, it's a very expensive process to keep doing this or do it when everybody comes in. We have to find other ways to look at risk and look at, look at uh, who might have Alzheimer's. Next, next uh, slide. The, the other thing I want to mention, which, it, which you will hear more about, say, if you go to your doctor, is the fact that mild cognitive impairment is now most certainly a diagnostic criteria. It came up in the, in the uh, 2000 criteria as a, as a sort of a, a period between that preclinical period of Alzheimer's when somebody may have amyloid but no symptoms to the appearance of mild symptoms, to then outright dementia where it affects somebody's ability, ability to effectively um, and comprehensively run their life. So, and then we also know now based on research that that mild cognitive problems, we used to think always started with memory, but now we know that they may appear as other problems with visual spatial abilities or language, but that you can actually pinpoint these and then follow these folks. We know also mild cognitive impairment uh, patients within five years have about a 50% chance of dementia, in particular the amnestic moving to Alzheimer's disease. Next, next slide. So, so I have this one you know, on here to remind us of sort of the growth of Alzheimer's disease in the US. It's now the sixth leading cause of death. And this is from the Alzheimer's Association facts and figures every year. Um, 5.8 million Americans are living with Alzheimer's disease. And by 2050, that number will be 14 million. Think of that huge number. Why? Because we can't stop this inextricable course towards, towards dementia. But 14 million people is a massive number. It, it will require dramatic changes to hospitalization and, and, and rehabilitation care and all those things. Right now in Michigan, we have four, a little, you know, about 4,500 people um, who there's the number of deaths from Alzheimer's disease in 2017. And you can see at the very bottom right how the number of people age 65 and older living with Alzheimer's is increasing year by year in this state. Next slide. So now we'll talk a little bit about AAIC. I promise I'll get the AAIC, so here we go. So one of the first things that came out this year and sort of uh, coupled with AAIC was, was the new annual facts and figures. So again, they point out these significant issues. Here, one of the things they looked at is they looked at physician concerns. So primary care physicians have a really, you know, about half of them only in some ways, but at least half now have a recognition that this is a big and growing problem and we have to do something about it. Another thing that was highlighted is that 16 million Americans, 16 million people are unpaid caregivers for individuals with Alzheimer's disease. That's about a $244 billion cost out of pocket for these individuals. It's, it's, it's very significant, you know. And the other point is at the bottom left, you know, another thing to maybe point out is the giant cost change in Alzheimer's disease. I can't quite see that slide myself, but I think that's what it is. So it shows you the, the um, tremendous increase in cost to over a trillion dollars by 2050 to care for these 14 million people. This is not, you know, this is, don't talk to me now about, um, you know, um, our social security care and all. This itself is gonna dramatically change the, the picture. Next slide. So a lot of interest, there was a lot of interest in AAIC because of risk 
and protective factors, primarily because of the issues involved now in so far we haven't found that magic bullet. And if you can't find that magic bullet pill, you've got to start looking at other, other issues. And for a number of maybe, well, not a number of years, maybe the past five years, there's been a lot of interest at the AAIC uh, meetings about behavioral, environmental, health features in Alzheimer's disease, things that weren't quite there when we were desperate to find this pill. But now as we realize it may not be that easy a trip, we're beginning to look at all these other factors that affect Alzheimer's disease. Next slide. So one of them, and you can just clip through these as I go, but one of them is early risk factors. So education was one. In the YCAP study, they presented more information by that, demonstrating pretty clearly that that quality of early life education really makes a difference in risk, sort of putting enough up there that, that as some comes off, it's you still stay secure. Next slide. Health. Beside this issue of, of better education, better body, um, uh, less risk of Alzheimer's, we also learn in the, in the STAR study from African American youth who are being followed over time was the fact that all these basic medical features, hypertension, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, the very things we know that our risk factors are all associated with worse late, late life cognition, especially when they occur younger in life. Next slide. Oh, I'm sorry, BMI, forgot the BMI. <laughs> there was another study that looked at, at, at BMI as well, saying that early, BMI in early adulthood, high BMI, BMI in early adulthood, actually also was associated with with later life dementia risk. Women more so than men to some degree, but next slide. But a big set of studies, a number of studies were looking at obesity itself. Middle age, and in middle age now, people are able to go back through their long-term studies now that they've been, been looking at um, health in the United States and in, in other countries over longer periods of time, now they can go back and look at earlier life factors. So we now know that middle-aged individuals who are obese have about a 30% higher risk than those in the healthy weight gain to have Alzheimer's disease. I mean, that's amazing. And that was independent of all those factors you, you think about like age, education, sex, blood pressure. It, it's a dramatic finding. And we know that that risk is even greater in women, interestingly enough, with abdominal obesity. So, you know, you, you sort of have um, pear-shaped obesity and apple-shaped obesity, and, and apple-shaped obesity is abdominal obesity in, tens, in terms of how the body looks. So sort of measured by your waistline. We know that that's a significant risk for women wasn't particularly a relationship for men, but it was certainly for women. Again, pointing out to us, we know women have a higher risk for dementia. How are some of these features interplaying with them? But if you look at, at weight and, weight and waist across the genders, 28% higher odds. So, you know, this really again points out to people, well, you know, what if we got together could we prevent at least a significant portion of these dementia cases by, um, by weight reduction and things? What if we just changed life course and worked to try and get people to understand, would this make a difference? Next slide. I just slow this slide just to show you the uh, middle belt, it's called. Of, of obesity, which unfortunately starts in our upper peninsula and comes down, but this is very significant to consider. This obesity risk is a very significant problem because obesity leads to all these other issues, metabolic syndrome and everything else, all of which significantly heighten your risk. Next slide. Now, there are a couple of, of other interesting uh, studies, too. One was Hispanic Latino population, the, the Saul Inca study um, that Hector Gonzalez, who used to uh, be with us at Michigan and Michigan State and um, at Wayne State, um, their work is finding that, that, importantly so, some of the same 
known risk factors among Latin American populations um, may promote healthy aging if you can control them. Next, next one. Um, the other thing that, that this study has shown pretty co consistently and significantly was the fact that a the APOE gene, the, the one gene we really know has the strongest impact in Alzheimer's disease risk is primarily in whites in white European descended populations. It, does, it has a weaker effect in Latin Americans and it has a weaker effect, for example, in black Americans. So what this has to tell us overall, has to tell how um, Hispanic Latino community, the, the African American community, that because you got to be in these research studies, because here's a case where everybody was talking about APOE, but when you start to look at differences, race differences there, you really see that impacts may relate to other things. Next, next slide. So I also want to go through these real quickly, but they're interesting. Another set of studies talked about vaccines. So for example, the flu vaccine and the pneumococcus vaccine, the pneumonia vaccine, both of these affected, you can, you can uh, flip through these slides, through this, uh, yeah. Both of these appeared to significantly reduce risk. And even in, with the pneumonia gene, carriers of some particular, the TOM40 gene actually appeared to have an even higher risk. And these are large scale studies. So it's very interesting, next, next uh, pieces to the bottom. So these are just observational studies, but again, they highlight the fact that perhaps Alzheimer's disease can be linked to weakened immune system. That Alzheimer's disease is linked to a lot of things that one magic pill just may not fix. Next slide. Um, there was also, a, you can flip through these and bring them all up, but there was a, also a, um, a um, Cochrane study, they call it a, a review study presented about, there's a lot of interest in cognitive um, training and cognitive training has been used in younger individuals and in individuals with mild cognitive impairment, but it hasn't been used much in individuals with mild to moderate dementia. So this study reviewed the 33 studies that have, have used that so far. And they did find a small to moderate effect but honestly, that effect was pretty similar to what you'd see with other approaches like mindfulness or reminiscence. So anything you're doing for the brain may make that difference, but there's not a lot of studies here yet, and it'll take some longer um, look and see, but still, that was an interesting study. Now, let's talk about the next slide, biomarkers. So the, remember that what I was telling you before, how the heck do we measure? I mean, you know, we know we can use a scanner. I can buy a whole lot of amyloid and tau scans for my study, but it costs a huge amount of money. What can we do here? So this is some interesting research going on. Next slide. So the whole point of this research is that we kind of know what normal aging looks like. We kind of know what the Alzheimer's sort of decline looks like, but there next, push it one more time, but there appears to be this ideal prevention zone. I mean, what, what about this normal aging or to when you first see that preclinical, that pathology change, that's again, this is where we have to really truly affect things, but we can't do it if we can't truly see what's going on. Next slide. So, there was an interesting study, one study looking at amyloid because right now for many people, amyloid scanning is not covered by insurance except for some specific cases where you're trying to rule out frontal temporal disorder. So the IDEAS study, which is led by the Alzheimer's Association, really put through some very interesting data on the effectiveness of amyloid slides, scans. Excuse me, let me see that you can just hit the next, the rest of the slide. So evaluating, this is really looked at, is it worth doing amyloid scans on patients? So, so several things could now be reported as this study continues. A major thing is, 
adding or removing medications was occurring about a 60% of the people with, who had been previously diagnosed as MCI and 60%, 63% of patients with dementia. Because clearly some patients appeared not to have dementia or some patients clearly appeared to have MCI. So the way doctors prescribed medications was changing if they had that information and even diagnoses were changing where patients had been told they had Alzheimer's disease and there was no amyloid, so therefore there was no Alzheimer's, that was all beginning to change. So there's gonna be a lot more research to do. Again, the recognition that in this study, the, the black and the Latino populations are really dramatically low. So that's where the Alzheimer's Association is really gonna put its, its money right now and its, its influence to try and record these groups. Next slide. So blood-based biomarkers, this is the hot topic. So this came up in 2018. There was a lot of interest in blood-based biomarkers. And what usually happens at AAIC, it's kind of interesting. Some hot topic comes up and then two years later pops up again. So what, because people have done more research on it. So one of the hot topics in, in uh, 2018 was, hey, we should be able to develop blood-based biomarkers. So a lot of time was spent. In 2019, there wasn't much information saying it, but in 2018, there were several studies using plasma P tau to 17 biomarker, which is a, a tau biomarker, but it also talks about amyloid, also gives you an amyloid ratio as well. So in a couple of different studies, the Swedish study where it could differentiate AD from normals and a study in Colombia with these early onset sort of familial history patients really was able to pick very early who was gonna develop Alzheimer's disease. So these kind of blood tests, this is the first really one to pretty carefully say, hey, this could be something. But we need to look at this. This is the problem with studies. If I take a group of healthy controls and a group of Alzheimer's patients, I may be able to differentiate them really easily but what happens when you look at everybody in Detroit or something? A whole various population with different levels of concern. How do you do that? So this is one of the, one of the measures that's gonna have a lot more research going on over the next year to two to be reported again at AAIC. This is one of the markers that our, our Michigan State group uses very, uh, as one of their panel of markers. Next, next uh, slide. So, because of, uh, I also wanted to talk to you about where we stand on clinical trials. So this was the 2019 results. You can just show these uh, all there. But in 2019, when I gave this talk, I had a lot of sad news to get to say. Pfizer was dropping its research. Biogen and SI had ended um, at a new cadaver because it's just, hey, look, folks, it's not showing anything in our, in our early look. After spending a million, we can't keep spending. Roche, dis, dis, uh, Roche Labs discontinued um, another drug as well for mild Alzheimer's. So this was a real question about, hey, this stuff just doesn't look what it, what's going on. What are we going to do? So shoot from 2019 to 2020. And uh, next slide. And, and we have a lot more things going on. So the Alzheimer's Clinical Trials Consortium has, has gotten together. The agreement was we need something beside the Alzheimer's centers. We need specifically a group of centers to coordinate within industry and really go after things. So this group has now um, stated two new trials and they're gonna use, um, they're, they're using, uh, actually not selenuzumab, they're using band 2401, excuse me. They were originally gonna use that, but, but their data had, had suggested this drug didn't work. So in the new A45 study, which is continuation of that A4 study I just mentioned, that's looking for people with amyloid in their brain, but not any cognitive impairment, and the A3 study that's actually gonna look at those people that, that had a little bit of amyloid, but not enough to push them over. Both of those studies are now changing to the band 2401 drug I'll mention in a minute. But 
but this is now a way of saying, look, we have an organized group of people all together. We can do this study right away. Does this remind you of, infl of, um, of uh, COVID vaccine things? It should, because this is the same significant approach. Next, next uh, slide. So let me add, let, last year I talked a lot about the hope of the prevention trials. So the first study was the A4 study. And as I mentioned, solanuzumab fell short. So A4 though is going to continue with the thought that we should have used high dose of solanuzumab. We should have used a higher dose. So that study is gonna continue. They're gonna lengthen the trial and they're gonna increase the dosage. The Diane two studies from the Alzheimer's Association, which are looking at, at individuals inherited network, they were looking at two different drugs and both of those drugs did not show a significant change over years in slowing cognitive decline. So it was a real concern. But the decision after looking at that was very interesting because one of those drugs, one of those drugs demonstrated an improvement in CSF spinal column measures of tauopathy and, and uh, of tau and amyloid. So again, they're going back with that drug and saying, look, this might really work. We're gonna quadruple the dose because we know we've always been so worried about very low doses, but we're gonna go to much higher doses and see if this has the effect. Next slide. Next slide. So I'm gonna quickly tell you about another one of these, just because adenucanab came up a minute ago when I was talking about it. So this is what happens in these studies. There was a tremendous amount of interest on the, the right-hand side when this study, when the preliminary study for this drug first came out. If you look at baseline to one year on their amyloid scans, they were showing significant difference in amyloid. People got excited. This was exciting. We all crammed into a, into a room went to hear this and nobody was supposed to take pictures, but everybody was yawning with their camera to take pictures. To, it, was, it was amazing data. But what happened is, next, hit that again. So it, it was it, this is it, targeting amyloid. Now we have a way to do it. But when the study went on another six months, next slide, it was interrupted. It was suspended because it, it appeared that nothing was happening. And then, push that one more time, a lot of interest came with BAN 2401, which is very similar to adenucanab. It's, it's owned by the same company. And so, okay, let's forget this adenucanab. Let's look at this BAN. And let's put that into studies, which has started. It's one of the drugs I mentioned to you up above uh, where I had the mistake on the slide. But just to show you how fast this happens, you know, you can make a mistake on your slides. But this targeting amyloid, hit the next thing, click to now, and suddenly add a new cannab is back. Turns out, in, if you look at the highest dose patients, there is a significant change. And now we know both in cognition and in amyloid tau. So suddenly, although this is only in the highest dose, it's back on. So this is part of the confusion and, and part of why people say you can't just, you know, suddenly do a, a study really fast and have a drug. This is an example of what happens because what happened with this drug is just by the chance of their randomization by how people were coming in, not enough high dose people got into that early assessment. So the drug kept being dumped, kept increasing, was dumped. Again, that's what happens in research, but now it does appear that this could be the first drug to actually change the disease process. And um, they have, this drug company has now asked for the government to, to look for approving this treatment. So this is, this is quite, quite exciting. But you can imagine what happened to the, to the company uh, stock each time there was a different announcement. Next, next slide. So I just want to show you this quickly. I know I'm running out of time here, but it takes us a while when, when we're flipping slides. But there are about 26 phase three drug trials. These are the bigger drug trials that look at how effective 
how effective is this treatment? And you can see 65% of them are um, anti-amyloid drugs. They're there to bust amyloid, to get rid of vaccines, to get rid of amyloid. About 4% are working on tau because so far we've not had a lot of luck with tau drugs. And 8% are, are looking at other things like inflammation. And 31% of drugs, which I think is critically important, 31% of the drugs are specifically looking at neuropsychiatric symptoms, agitation, sleep, apathy, all these things that are so important to study, those studies are now going on as well. And about 4% are aimed at other ways to enhance cognition. Next slide. I will mention this because I'm always saying there's nothing, this, this gut stuff is silly, but it came up in 2018 and a lot of my friends do this research. So I think it actually is important. But in 2018, everybody was talking about how the gut and how when we have stress and disease, it changes the gut. And often those bacteria are found in the brains of Alzheimer's patients, how exciting this was. And people were going, I don't know, but cut to now. And a lot of very interesting, next slide, a lot of very interesting studies came up. So one of these was an attempt to change using, um, just using a mouse model, but these are mice bred for amyloid. To, they're bred to look like they have, they will they're bred to develop Alzheimer's. They showed that if you took a group of these animals and, and gave them a high continuous cocktail of high dose antibiotics, you could actually, you wouldn't change the amount of bacteria in their, in their fecal matter, let's say, you know what it is. I can think of what my four-year-old grandson calls it, but, but you know, if, when you look at that, there was no change in the amount of bacteria, but the type of bacteria had changed dramatically. And the other interesting things about these mice was there was a significant 60% reduction in their brain plaque. And if you took uh, fecal microbia from animals that hadn't gotten this treatment and gave it to them, you, you reverse this and they began looking like the, the uh, animals that had never been treated. And they've even done an experiment looking at, at early postnatal course of antibiotics in animals. So this stuff is really interesting. This is a brand new way of looking at things that as we look for all these different things and all these different ways to treat this disorder and also to treat its myriad types and the myriad things that contribute to it, I have to admit that the gut bio may kind of uh, appear. Next slide. Hate to admit that because all my friends keep have been telling me that. But another thing was it mentioned that the COVID COVID nineteen impact has also been so the Alzheimer's Association announced at AAIC twenty that they are starting a very large global study to track the the significant effects of COVID exposure on people in terms of cognition, behavior, and general functioning and, and risk of, of dementia. And this will go on in, a, in over 30 countries uh, and WHO, World Health Organization, is doing the technical assistance and collaborating in this study. Next slide. So when we think of all this stuff going on, what it tells us is we're not there yet in, in meds. But you know, we know that lifestyle can have a real effect. Next slide. So I've, I've talked about for the past two years, the finger study that continues. It's a seven year study, but I, in 2018, I guess it was after two years, they'd already shown a significant change in cognition in, in, uh, in older individuals who were included by doing this four part sequence. So rather than the sort of like all of us who do a lot of research here in this country, it's constantly show me what's, you know, show me the money. What's the one thing that changes? But in Finland, they said, we're not going to worry about figuring out the one thing that causes an effect. We're going to do a lifestyle change. We're going to look at nutrition. We're going to look at exercise. We're going to look at cognitive training. We're going to look at monitoring vascular metabolic risk. And they've already shown amazing changes in this study. Next slide. 
And there are now, because of those amazing changes, there are now worldwide fingers going on. The worldwide finger network has appeared where the Alzheimer's Association is coordinating these studies in over 25 countries. Again, those same basic pieces, counseling, physical, dietary counseling, physical exercise, cognitive and training, and, and monitoring health. But importantly with these studies, there's a whole piece on the need to be culturally sensitive. Like, how do you present these studies in, in, um, in Singapore? Do you approach these more, not by diet, but by some, some other way primarily? In each of these countries, there are some adjustments, but they're using the same outcomes and the same basic study methods. So all of the Alzheimer's Association will be able to pull all of this data together. It's just, it's, it's gonna be a be all end all, it's amazing. Next slide. And so while all those fingers are going on um, across the world, the US has its pointer study, which is also part of the group. They didn't wanna call it the finger study, they wanted to call it the pointer study. I'll leave that up to you all to think about but but so basically the same thing let's take people um since no medications have really worked and since the effect of the fi original finger trial is already more than any of these anti-alzheimer's drugs have shown let's use this again those same pieces for two years we're going to study physical exercise nutrition cognitive training improved health monitoring will look at all these things in four in four um, cities with very large sort of um, databases uh, medical databases and things that are all interconnected and we'll study that here either people get a, a fixed course or no course and things so it's it's really interesting next next slide I think that stuff will really tell us something so let me talk to you in my seven minutes left a little bit about our center. I'm gonna take a little bit more about trying to be quick. So we are one of 32 Alzheimer's uh, ADRCs, Alzheimer's research centers in the country. Why is that important? Because we've contributed already 500 participants to a total whopping, because we, we got a little late into this only five years ago, but we've con there is now a whopping 42,661 participants in this study across all these centers that have all been studied the same way. I mean, I once was excited to do a PET scan study years and years ago with 22 people. Now you can do a PET scan study with 42,000 people. And all of this data is open available for researchers to use. The idea is that we'll look at different markers, cognitive markers, imaging markers, blood-based markers, CSF markers, all of these things will be looked at and looked at the same way across these studies. So when you have much bigger studies, you have much, much bigger chance of finding significant results. Next study, next slide, sorry. Um, so it, this is what our Michigan Alzheimer's Disease Research Center is part of, is part of, uh, this is our group. We are a true three center research program with Michigan State, Alzheimer's disease, uh, Mich excuse me, Michigan State, MSU, and Wayne State. And over on the right side, you can see our new Michigan ADRC logo that, that uh, all the folks are quite proud of. And it is really cute with all the different colors of, the, of, the, um, of, of our sister schools in this process. But you can see across that screen that we relate to the Alzheimer's associations in that area. And then we also relate to those university sites, University of Michigan, Wayne State, and Michigan State, which for some reason gets to have two sites, but you know, Michigan State lucks out again. But anyway, there is that. We are across Michigan and everybody is interconnected. Next slide. I'm not gonna spend a long time on this, but this basically, is the organization of our center for our new grant going in. There's an administrative core, but the important components are those components across the middle. There's a clinical core, which uses all the techniques that all the other centers are done to diagnose and 
and evaluate patients coming in. There's a neuropathology core that now uses the same techniques that other pathology cores in these other 32 centers are using. We, we have a data core that manages our data in this and puts all of this data together and helps our researchers do even larger scale data studies. We have a biomarker core, and this is the, this is a, a, although each, in each of these cores, there are members of all groups of each university intermixed in here, but our biomarker core is primarily at Michigan, at Michigan State up in Grand Rapids and their group, and they are looking really heavily at, at blood-based biomarkers. And, and our imaging core, which will be based here at, at uh, University of Michigan, which is really looking at, um, at, at uh, structural MRI and functional MRI approaches, as well as sort of collaborating together with all of us who have PET and uh, amyloid uh, markers and CFS studies going on to, to link all of that data. We also have our outreach and recruitment core that goes out and contacts individuals that does the education to bring people into research. And the, the wellness initiative down there and the Ryan Louis body initiative, both important parts of that, of that core. And then at the very bottom is the really critical research education component. The whole idea on this is let's find junior investigators from postdoc to junior faculty and really educate them in the areas of Alzheimer's disease. So we have all sorts of instructional videos. We have regular meetings. It's been a close group. And then our center interacts very much with the Michigan Center for Urban African American Aging Research with multiple uh, Rick Mars coming off of that study, as well as to other larger groups doing research in the university corridor. Next study. So I'm gonna go through these quickly, but I just wanted to show there's the whole group up there at MSU doing, doing their work and nice to see none of them are really wearing, well, I guess some of them are, Scott's wearing green, but in pathology and in, and in blood-based biomarkers, They're, that's a real strength for MSU. Jonah Lardo, that's part of our, our outreach core is very important in Michigan to the state of uh, outreach and, and working with uh, caregivers. Amara, as your mom is, uh, down below on the bottom right is one of our um, Rec Corps mentees who does a lot of quite a bit of work with me as well. And she's the person I go to if I want to understand gut issues. She just got a brand new R01. And, and this is part of the under, you know, she's my person, my go to person about what does the gut really mean. And she's also the person who keeps reminding me, I told you so. But anyway, next slide. Um, our, this is our Wayne State group, some of our Wayne State researchers. Peter Lichtenberg, who's the director there at Wayne State, he's also was just not, um, just chosen, just voted in as the um, director of the Gerontological Society of America, which is just a major honor. He's, he's been very interested in caregiver issues and, and financial autonomy. Jessica down below is, a, is interested in imaging and, and early detection. Voiko, who's, who's very much interested, I'll show you a slide of that in a minute, looking at EEG effects. But, but there's just so much research going on. Next slide. So I want to show you some of our research really quickly, I promise. Hank Paulson is looking at primarily at how do all these different diseases interact to tell us something about what are the similarities? Because it turns out all these diseases in many ways are based on misfolded, mis misconnected, um, you know, proteins and things. We know what what's going on here, so it's really important to understand how all these proteins interact. Next slide. But he's looking at that across disease. Fascinating work. We got Sammy uh, Bramada here doing very interesting work in in uh, frontal temporal dementia and sort of. Um, uh, plate models of Alzheimer's disease and things. Next, next slide. How do you look at Alzheimer's disease in a lab? We've got Judy Heidebrink, who, who really directs a lot of our clinical research and is the named professor in clinical research at the university. She is looking now at starting the A3 and A4-5 study I already mentioned to you using band 2401. So this is a big deal starting up here. Next slide. 
with all this imaging stuff and all these blood biomarkers and things like this, we have Scott, Lang, uh, Scott Roberts, who's very, Scott is really interested in, in looking at what happens though in terms of patients and caregivers. What is this information you get? Oh, hi, you have a lot of amyloid in the brain. Well, what does that really mean? It may not really mean anything about Alzheimer's. It may say something about risk, but their studies are looking at risk notification. Next next uh, slide. Gonna go fast. Ben Hampstead is doing a lot of work on the fascinating, you know, use of transcranial direct current stimulation. He's one of the world's experts on this. And um, it it's just, you know, it's like you put two little electrodes, you have a little battery, but there's something about stimulating the brain areas. For example, when you're doing cognitive training, that really seems to emphasize that effect. Next, next uh, slide. And all these slides are gonna be on the website, so we'll have them for you. But there is Voico and I are doing a lot of, uh, doing a, a large study now looking at, at, at uh, EEG and computerized testing results out in the Detroit community. What happens if we can do things out in the community that are simple things that are well liked? Can we look at those things together, hit that one more time, and look at both EEG and cognitive test results. And frankly, when we do that, we're already about 88% accurate in, in comparing MCI cases to normals, which is what's most important when you're trying to do clinical trials out there. Next, next slide. Next slide. Uh, you can bounce through these real quick. This is uh, Lynette, who's, who's been doing a lot of work in really interesting work in cardiovascular um, management for African-American women. It's, it's really important, again, applying these different things. How do we apply different approaches to different communities? And she's really looking at cardiovascular health in this way. Next slide. And there's, I, I don't know which, which way I could, <laughs> so all these people are popping up. I couldn't remember how I mixed the, all the slides together. This is, this is Sharia, who's also working in Detroit, as well as other areas across the country, actually looking at improving outcomes for caregivers of persons with dementia. What can we best do to help, but from a cultural standpoint, how can we develop culturally based systems? Next slide. Um, this is, you know, look for this in the future, but we have a large study about to start to look at driving. So for example, we know that this is Michigan and everybody drives. What can just our responses, even when you're being safe, what could some of our responses about driving in, a, in cars we can drop a little box into and will tell us everything about how the person drives, where where they're going, things like that. And we can link this, we'll be doing a lot of imaging to link this to look at, can simple everyday things tell us a little bit more about when we should worry? Next slide. This is our regular old fashioned a map that I talk about all the time, but here we are just monitoring people over time. We're looking at the development of healthy aging. We're looking at the development of cognitive concerns and all these individuals are in our large data set that's part of the uh, ADRCs across the country. Next, next slide, I'm getting there. Okay, we do a few more things, but research. Um, we've got the brain bank to study brains and give samples of Alzheimer's and other disorders out across the country. We've become very important in that. Next slide. We've got Nan Barbas, who has a whole sequence of programs she's doing to really make a change in medical school. And, and uh, also there's a whole set of programs through social work to, to really talk about training for dementia, for dementia workers. Next slide. We have our Lewy Body Initiative I've already mentioned. I'm sorry, Danielle, give me two minutes. Lewy Body Dementia We uh, Initiative, next slide. Our wellness initiative, there's Laura. I had to get to this slide. That's Laura down there who makes me always feel relaxed when I'm in a, a panic. She, her, that work on stress resilience and well-being. Next slide. Our wellness has even expanded now to doing work, education and other types of work with, with um, support groups. Next slide. So 
This is the slide where I'm supposed to say, please help us. We've got 15 solid research, major research studies going ongoing. We need your help to do that across the categories. You can find that full list of studies on our website. Next slide. So we need your help. Complete the research volunteer form for our center. Whenever you see one, please, and on our website, you can contact Kate, who'll help you do that. For God's sakes, please sign up for Trial Match at ALZ.org. Trial Match is an amazing program that will tell you what sort of research, including our studies, is going on in your area. You could use clinicaltrials.gov, but it'll take you all sorts of time to figure that out because I was just on it this morning trying to look for something. But trialmatch.org has got the information you want locally. You can spread the word. Come to new educational events coming up for Alzheimer's Association, brain donation program, our wellness initiatives, our Lewy body support groups. Please volunteer for the Alzheimer's Association. Help those with Alzheimer's and please attend one of the walks or state advocacy day. One of those things, get involved. Thank you. That's it. You can just jump through these, Danielle, to the last slide. All right. There we go. That's our group Thank right you. there. As you can see, that was taken a long time ago because I don't see masks and I see absolutely no <laughs> social distancing. So that was a while ago. So sorry, I'm seven minutes over, I think. I, I didn't quite do it, but I, I tried. We got, we got here, we got here. Thank you. So um, thanks again. We really appreciate that information. So now if you have questions, um, please feel free to put them in the Q&A box and we will go through some of the questions. I'm going to try to get through this. If we don't get a chance to answer your question live, then we'll send you an email to make sure that um, you do receive a response. So the first question we have, what is the average time period between initial increased amyloid deposits and diagnosis of AD? Well, it's really different for everybody, but we know that that amyloid deposits at least 20 years before symptoms start. But don't forget, again, it's back to what part of the brain exactly is involved and how much is involved. And we have folks with where, where we have both amyloid and tau, we can clearly see on scans, yet they don't yet show the memory changes. It very much depends upon what, what part of the brain. But we do know that amyloid is laying down at least 20 or 25 years before any symptoms even appear. Okay, so you talked about amyloid and tau scans being extremely expensive and was suggesting other ways for early diagnosis. What other cheap ways do you advocate, particularly <laughs> for individuals living in low income countries? Right, so one of the things, um, if we ever get that blood marker, uh, thanks to uh, everybody up at Michigan State, both the Lansing group and the um, Grand Rapids group, maybe that will be a help along those ways. Any type of markers would be a huge help, but we don't have them yet. We, we have been looking at EEG changes, as I mentioned, and, and complex cognitive tasks that are presented on computer that, that we can use in Africa on uh, tablets and things for a number of my studies going on that way, but still, it's still too early to tell. Is there any possibility that there might be chemical changes in urine that could be detected but aren't being looked for now? You know, I, I don't know what research is. That's a good question. I don't, you know, you certainly see um, it's, it's much more feasible to see this in fecal matter than urine, but, but a lot of things wash through the body. I don't, I don't know anybody who's actually doing research on that. I'd be be really interesting. I okay. got, got to look it up. All right. So regarding vaccines, was the research done so that we could be um, reasonably confident that the risk reduction is due to um, physio excuse me, physiology, so immunity, inflammation, um, rather than a marker for other healthy lifestyle choices? Well, we know that, for example, probably in the end, you've got to do both. But the, the studies have been done, the imaging studies have been done to try to find those early risk markers 
for Alzheimer's. Now that's one piece in the pattern. Can we identify people early on we need to worry about? But at the same time, the lifestyle stu studies are saying, heck, let's start 20, 25 years before it ever appears and let's start lowering that risk. Maybe let's, let's make these studies uh, not needed. Let's really make lifestyle changes that will reduce risk. Okay. Can neuropsych tests be a good early marker for AD? So, for example, a face name task? Face name task is a really yes. interesting task. It, there is some very intriguing data suggesting that that task, even among, may be sensitive to, to uh, individuals who, who, are, who have amyloid deposits, but not yet Alzheimer's disease. There's a lot of interest. But for a lot of these tasks, it's how difficult and challenging is it? Face name especially is a, is a task that, that affects the hippocampus where we know, I mean, it's, it's involving those aspects of the brain where we know amyloid and tau um, changes first appear. It's also a challenging test. So the difficulty is how can you make a test not so challenging that people give up but also not so easy that everybody can do it. So face name is, is there's a couple of other tasks out there, but face name is really one of the most interesting tests. Okay. Um, can you speak to blood test viability? You, you know, it's, it's too hard to tell yet about blood tests. Okay. It's just too hard. I mean, we've got research coming down the pike and we certainly can see it in animals. But, but in, in people, we just haven't done the studies yet. Okay. You talked about factors in obesity that correlate with the risk of having Alzheimer's disease. Does gut bacteria also play a significant role within the development of Alzheimer's? Um, yeah, Danielle, you've got so many questions. I'm impressed. Um, yes, we think that gut bacteria may have quite a bit to do with the development of all, not perhaps not me because I was a late comer to it, but maybe Amara at Michigan State knew it, but, but we believe that a lot of these gut bacteria are seen in the brain of, of individuals who have died who had Alzheimer's disease. You see buildups of those bacteria that you don't see in, in healthy individuals who have died. There's another bacteria that last year I talked a lot about that's actually related to gum disease. That also appears up there but that gum disease is associated also with the gut. So yes, these, these issues of, of gut, back, but the problem is what's the right biome, gut biome for everybody? We don't know yet what, what it should look like. Okay. But we do um, know it's, it's affected by Alzheimer's. Okay, a couple more. So. We have an autopsy report. Um, someone has an autopsy report for their dad who died of um, Lewy body dementia. So would that type of information be any help for your research? And if so, what do they need? Yeah, it, it, we, we have lots of uh, research and we have been very interested in individuals who have passed away with Lewy body disease. That's a, and also because of studying familial um, patterns in that disease. So yes, it's certainly something we'd be happy to talk to you about. Okay. Um, is there anything that can be done to reduce memory loss or stop and slow the advance? Um, someone's mother was diagnosed with um, Alzheimer's dementia for about three years. Well, you know, that one study I mentioned that tried to look at cognitive training um, rather than pre-memory problems, look at cognitive training for people with memory problems. Cognitive it seemed to show some differences on some key functions. I mean, but basically what it means is, even with Alzheimer's, if you eat right, if you exercise, if you do cognitive training and you make sure your health's maintained, you probably will slow that, that drive of the illness. We know that those are factors that affect the, the rapidity for which Alzheimer's appears. So even for somebody with Alzheimer's, studies have been done to show that these, um, these um, you know, changes in terms of 
of health and um, lifestyle are very important. Okay. The risk, what is the risk level for someone, um, a, the, my dad, my dad's sister has dementia um, and also my mom has an unspecified dementia. So does that put me at risk? You, you know, we can't really tell risk. Um, you know, and that's the complicated thing. You can, you can spend however many hundreds of dollars it is to do 23andMe and they'll tell you your APOE risk, but that really doesn't mean anything, you know, directly. But we do know that if families carry the APOE and several family members have had Alzheimer's, not unspecified dementia, that does increase the risk. But again, you might say the expression of that 50% risk won't occur till you're 140, so hard to tell. Okay, and what about measuring amyloid or tau and spinal fluid? Yep, <laughs> that's what they do in Europe. It costs okay. you $450 a pop to give you amyloid and tau. In this country to do a scan cost to do both, it's around $14,500. CSF would be wonderful, but it's not something that people in this country want to do. CSF fluid shows you very, very good information about amyloid and tau. It shows you how little amyloid there is because it's clumping in the brain. It shows you how much tau is falling out. It shows you other factors as well that are critically important, but it's not something we do. Now in Amsterdam, you go in for, gee, I think I, I got a headache. I might have a little memory problems, boop, get a CSF. Here, we don't do that. It, it varies by country, but in general, people are so afraid of what now can be commonly done without a problem on the outpatient basis because you know, one flew over the cuckoo's nest, whatever it was, just scared everybody to death and it's, it stayed in this culture, but that is the way to truly tell. CSF is very important. Okay. All right. Um, so for the sake of time, we are going to wrap things up. There were a couple of questions that we didn't get a chance to um, answer online, but we will respond to those questions. So thank you again, Bruno, for your presentation. Thank you, everyone, um, again. So just a couple of more things. Thank my four-year-old grandson, because he didn't uh, you know, butt in with us right now. That was pretty nice. Well, thank you. <laughs> the power of Paw Patrol on TV. So. <laughs> I know how that works. Um, so again, just some ways to stay in contact with things that are going on, um, activities in the center. Feel free to subscribe to our monthly e-newsletter. We will be having another speaker series coming up next month. So also be on the look and stay tuned for information regarding um, next month's presentation. We'll be doing some promo for that as well. And also don't forget to register for walk so that you can get your fleece blanket just in time for the weather to change. Um, thank you everybody. Have a great day. Thanks Bruno. Bye folks.